Welcome to the Transformers Explained series. Transformers are at the heart of most of the state of the art AI models today. Even ChatGPT and even other language models like BERT use Transformers at their core. In this series, we will try to understand how Transformers work from start to end. We will look into each section of the Transformer architecture and understand how they work, how they understand words, how they are able to communicate with you, how they are able to do other language tasks like language translation so well. Transformers were introduced in the 2017 paper from Google called Attention is All You Need. Attention as a concept came a few years back in 2014. We will understand what this term attention means also in detail in the series. Let's say we have a simple task at hand of translating this English sentence the cat is on the carpet and translated to Hindi, Billy, Kali, and Parahe. And in this, the word Billy means cat and Kali means carpet for those of you who don't know Hindi. This would be helpful later on. Let us assume that we have a huge data corpus. Um, let us assume that we have language pairs, that is English and Hindi, and you have the direct translations like uh, certain English sentence to the direct Hindi translation, etc. We have a huge data which is in this manner. How would you use that data to create some sort of a model for translation? You could say we can use some kind of a statistical measure. In fact, this was the first thing which was used. As in, you can see what kind of a frequency, like let's say you take the words, the cat, and how often is it that when this pair of words appear, that in the respective translations, Billy appears. And most likely, there's a lot of occurrences of this. And you can just see that the translation is to this. But this won't work as well, as you can see, uh, because language is structured in a very different manner. And even over here, there is just four words Total, like this is the first, second, third, fourth word. And over here, there is one, two, three, four, five, six words. It's not even a direct one-to-one -one translation of each words. There is some kind of a need to understand the context of this as well. Like if you follow it up and then you say it, it is awake now, then you don't know what it means in this context. So statistical model might work in some cases, but it's not that scalable. Whereas history tells you it doesn't fare that well. So in 1986, a new class of models called RNNs, recurrent neural networks, were found. So in the case of normal feed-forward neural networks, or like the normal neural networks, you would just feed in some kind of an input, and then you would get the output. If you pass this whole sentence, the cat is on the carpet, and then you're expecting this to be on the other side. And it doesn't work at all using a normal neural network. You cannot, first of all, represent this as well and just expect the model to just learn it through some hidden states. This is especially because there is no connection between any of these words. It doesn't understand that it is a certain sentence or like how each words relate to each other or anything of that manner. So another idea was using recurrent neural networks. In recurrent neural networks, it is normally represented using some kind of uh, recurrent loops over here, which means that once it goes through a forward propagation, and by the way, if you want to understand how the classic neural networks work, or how back propagation works, how pro forward pass works, you should look at Raj Randeker's course in this channel. Now let's come back to this. So over here, you might feed one word, and then you might expect the exact translation of that here. That doesn't work so well either over here because there is like six words over here and four words. There is no direct translation to the word. The. There are a lot of issues when you try to directly translate from one language to another. Especially over here, Kali or carpet is a second word. And over here, it only comes in the end. You cannot just do a direct one word to the next word translation. Another thing which would help is if we have some kind of a representation. We learned some kind of a middle representation. That we take the English language and we convert it into some kind of a representation. Like some kind of a metrics or values. And then from there, we train another network which uses this representation and we translate it into Hindi. It might be something like that which we use in our own heads as well. When we translate from one language to another, 
Sometimes if you do a one-to-one -one translation, we might mess up. But on the other hand, if you understand the whole context and we try to construct the other language from it, it works quite much more effectively. So when we do something like that, we have an encoder and a decoder. An encoder is something which takes from a source language and converts it into a certain context, a context which is there in the middle. And that is what the encoder does. And what the decoder does is once you have some kind of a contextual information, what the encoder has translated from or like stored from the source language, we can use that context to translate back into the target language. So what happens in the case of recurrent neural networks, we can even club in LSTMs together with RNNs in this case, is that first you feed one word into the network and then you get some kind of an output. And this can be taken as the hidden state. Let's mark this as hidden state one. And when the next word is fed in, the cat, when this is being encoded, the network also has access to this hidden state as well here. So this hidden state H1 is being fed back to the model over here. So when it is learning to represent the next word, which is cat, it also takes in information from the previous word. So it gets fed word by word into the encoder. First, the goes in to the network, and then you get the hidden state one. And then you feed in cat, and then you get hidden state two. And then you feed ease, and similarly you get hidden state three. And then you feed on, the, and carpet. And then you get different hidden states at, on each of these stages. You get hidden state four, hidden state five. So hidden state five has some context of all of these previous words. And finally, when carpet is also encoded to this, the final state, which will be like H6, will have the context of all of these prior words. And now that we have H6 over here, this is what is being passed to the decoder. Now that since the final context or the hidden state over here has information of all of the prior words, the decoder can just predict the first word using this. So it might predict Billy over here. And then now it has the access to this word as well as this context. So it maintains some kind of a hidden state in the decoder as well. So once you have uh, this first word over here, let's say it has a decoder's hidden state over here, D1. And then it also has access to H6. So it uses H6 and D1, and then it predicts the next word, which is carpet, which is Kali. And once you have this, you have another hidden state coming out from here, which is D2. And when the next word is taken, it has the access to this hidden state, which encodes both of these together, as well as the hidden state over here at 6, the final hidden state. And that is taken along with this, and then the next word is found. And this might seem to work for small sentences, but when you look at a huge sentence, let me take an example. Over here, we have the word it. But it is necessary that this it means the cat. These kind of models, uh, which are above, only has one particular hidden state. And it is very difficult for it to capture such a word or like such relations that these two mean the same. And it doesn't work very well in practice. In 2014, the concept of attention came in. And the idea was that we can pay attention to each of these words separately. Earlier, it was such that you have one word, and then it goes into a hidden state. And then you have the next word, and then it goes into the hidden state again. And you have all of these hidden states, and you finally pass the final hidden state, which is H6. And that is being passed to the decoder. Over here, what is being done is that even though we have all of these uh, encoders repeating and on all of these hidden states in between, what is being fed to the decoder is all of these hidden states, H1, H2, H3, etc. So the decoder has all of these 
hidden states as input available. So the first hidden state has some context from the first word and the second has from the first and the second and so on. So how do we decide which of these hidden states the first generated word in the decoder must pay attention to or care about? So this is done using a softmax layer. So what is done is that we feed all of these hidden states together to this softmax layer. You can just see that they are being multiplied together. This is a matrix of all of these values together and this is another matrix, this is a softmax. What the softmax in effect does is that it scales down or like cancels out all of the values which are not needed that much. And these are important, right? So these values will be boosted and that will be shown out. And this itself is learned. The weights of the softmax is also learned as you train the model. So let's assume that all of these are drowned out once you train the model and the cat, these two hidden states are passed. So now that these two hidden states are passed, it can easily generate the first word. And when you generate word 2, you still have access to all of these hidden states as well as the previous state from the decoder. That means the first word, let's say in this case, Billy is generated. That word as well is taken over here, like the hidden state of that in the decoder and all of these states. So you have another softmax layer and it decides which of these hidden states it should like take out so that you get a better representation of the next word. And that is like Kaleen, right? Or that is carpet. But over here, carpet only comes in the end, in the sixth word. But over here, in the softmax layer, you drown out all the other words such that only carpet or maybe own to an extent. You'll have a less value for own. Maybe all the other values are just drowned out. So you only have these two values. So the decoder can pay attention to those hidden states in particular so that you can generate the next word Kali. Let me illustrate attention better with this example. In this specific case, it's called cross attention, which is a nuance you might keep in mind. This is because the attention is from this sentence to this sentence or this sentence to this sentence, which is different together. This is another language and then this is another language. And this is not the same thing. If it is the same, like the cat is on the carpet and the cat is on the carpet on both the rows and the columns, then it's called self-attention, which you will get into later in this course. And self-attention is at the heart of the transformer architecture. So over here, you can see that when you are generating the word Billy, it is paying so much attention to the word cat and very less on the other words. So when you have the representation of the cat, that can be easily translated into Billy. And when you go to this word Kaleen, when you have all of these words available, when you multiply it through the softmax, the carpet will come out with a larger value and that context will be used more. And the context of Billy, of course, will be used. So this will be used plus this. And that will be used to generate the word Kaleen. And when per is being generated, there is much attention paid to the word own. So whatever we generated before, that plus the hidden vector state from own will be used to generate this word. You can also see that some of the other words have some little, maybe instead of 0 0.1 over here, it might be 0 0.2. So there's a little bit of attention paid to this or a little bit of weightage given to this word as well. So that is the idea of Crow's attention. And this idea of attention worked pretty well. And there are some more shortcomings of this model as well. The first issue is that you have an encoder and a decoder. You have an encoder and you have a decoder and you have some kind of a hidden state representation in between. The first issue is that you feed words one by one. You would feed the first word, second word, etc. If you have a whole book to feed, imagine there's like 12,000 words in it. How would you do it one by one? That would be very slow. And the learnings for each of the tokens are like done one by one. And even if you manage to create such a model and you scale it up so much that there are so many layers and there is so much hardware capability for this, it wouldn't still work because if you have a very long sentence and you mention some word over here and then you have some reference 
way later on, let's say 10,000 words later, and you're referring back to this word, it won't have any idea what this means, just using these hidden representations. And the softmax layer also won't help by paying attention to this word. It would have no idea that it has to pay attention to this word. We should keep in mind that these softmax layers and weights and this decoder encoder, all of this is trained using the initial language corpus we had of the language pairs between two different languages. So this would not help in understanding the long-term dependencies. Now let us look at the savior, the transformer model. This figure, which is featured in the original paper, might look a bit daunting at the first glance, but don't worry about it. We'll look into each of these sections one by one, and we'll try to understand it. Here you can see that there is already the word called attention, and attention is at the heart of the transformer model itself. But there are a lot of optimizations, and the entire architecture is so parallelizable, and it's different from a sequential model like an LSTM, that it works so well. Even in this model, there is an encoder-decoder architecture. So all of this is the encoder, and this is the decoder. So what the model does is it takes the input, it somehow converts it into an embedding, or like some kind of a representation. There is an input embedding in the previous models also, like RNNs and LSTMs, and they have a multidimensional vector, or like a matrix with so many values in each of these values showing some kind of a context to what the word means. And similar words will have like similar numbers in some of these rows. I have explained in detail how these word embeddings work in my previous video. So once you have the input embedding set, it is fed into the encoder. And over here, you can see that there is n into the encoder. There is multiple encoders. So instead of a simple encoder in the previous case, there are multiple encoders in this case. And you finally stack up all of them together, and then you get a very context-rich representation of whatever was fed. And that would be the encoder's output. And in the decoder stage, the decoder has this access to this output, which is from the encoder. That means like in the previous case, where the hidden states are passed, instead over here, there's a context-rich representation. So in the transformer, in the first state, the input embeddings are given. And from there, it is sent to all of these encoders. And these encoders provide a context. And then the decoders start to generate the first word. And you should note that the decoder generates the words one by one. At the same time, it has access to all of this context from the encoder. It generates the first word, and it outputs a similar context so far. And this entire context is fed back into the decoder along with the cross attention from the encoder. And using the context from the entire word, which is translated, let's say, from English, it has the understanding of the entire word that is fed to the decoder as well as the previous generated output from the decoder. Both of these together is fed in so that the next word can be generated. And finally, there is some post-processing, which is using the linear layer and the softmax layer that you can get the outputs from here. There are several things in this architecture which makes it much more viable than an RNN. First of all, there is the ability to parallelize it. That means that each of these encoder blocks can be trained in parallel. This input embedding can be trained in parallel. The decoder, as in this phase, entirely can be trained in one GPU and all of the others can be trained in another GPU. This limitless parallelizing possibilities in the transformer. And this is why using our current hardware or even specialized hardware, it is quite... So this makes it easy to train even a large language corpus using the transformer architecture. This would have been impossible if we used the LSTM or RNN architectures. In the next videos, we will look into each of the sections, starting with the input embedding and the encoder architecture, when the attention and what happens and what all of these lines mean, and how the final output is produced, and how the model understands some kind of a context, how the very rich contextual representation is produced by this architecture. Thank you.